And once you've decided to use the drug, counselling is the key thing about the consultation. They must be informed and also seem to be informed as well. So I always get informed consent. I always get written informed consent for this drug. You should always discuss pregnancy in any fertile woman. You should always discuss mood change and always give written information to the patient, key things which we'll elaborate on later. And as a general guide, I like long and low dosing rather than short and high dosing. Low dosing is far better tolerated than high dosing. And actually the outcome is the same. It just takes longer to get there and the patients tolerate it far more easily. So the first question is, how are we gonna define acne? What's mild, moderate or severe? And to you and I, it's pretty obvious looking at these two photos on the left and the right. But actually, to be honest, to the patient, it can be quite surprising. And actually, that is me in my gummies there holding my own ladder up because I didn't have a photograph <laughs> of a ladder and I didn't want to breach copyright. So I got my wife to take this photo the other weekend. Um, notice the sun protection as well as a broad room hat mm -hmm. there. Very good. Yes. So um, the question is, how is mild, moderate and severe acne defined? Is it defined by the doctor or by the patient? And where should isotretinoin go on that acne severity ladder? And we'll cover that through this talk. And the key thing is, don't be swayed by your own preconceptions. So the patient whose back you can see, to you and I, honestly, it's horrendous acne. But occasionally, particularly teenagers will come in and appear to be indifferent about it. Actually, they're usually not. And teenagers can be very good at hiding how they actually feel. And on the other hand, if you look at the lower slide, there are a few papules and pustules. There's a bit of scarring. That's not too bad, perhaps. But for some patient, that may be the worst thing in their lives. So you can never prejudge how they're going to perceive their own acne and that's a principle for most dermatological disease so it's key to find out how the acne troubles them very important and don't be swayed by your own preconceptions so once you've decided you're going to do it you need to sit down and talk to them about the drug and in fact most of the consultation should be about discussing with the patient what they're letting themselves in for some are predictable side effects and some of them are unpredictable. So dryness is universal, universal. And actually it's interesting that people have varying degrees of dryness with varying doses. So some people you can give a higher dose, they seem to be fine. And some people, even a lower dose is unacceptable to them. So you have to go even lower than you might anticipate. So the key is to moisturize and they will need often a moisturizer for their lips because they can get dry and a generalized moisturizer as well and some people develop eczema because they get so mm -hmm. dry and if that's the case then you need to wrap the dose down you'll know that it is highly teratogenic highly and fertile women must not get pregnant and one risk group that i've come across is perhaps middle-aged but fertile women who may have completed their family and perhaps be less um, careful about their contraception. So those are a risk group. So you need to make sure that they have adequate contraception. And as a dermatologist, I don't prescribe contraception. And I'm very grateful for people like Grace and yourselves out there for helping with that. Thank you. Skin fragility is very predictable. In fact, sometimes you'll know whether they're taking isotretinoin or not, because when you shake their hands and they come in, the hands will have a soft feel to them. And as a consequence of that, the epidermis shears more easily. So don't ever let a patient be waxed. And I've seen some awful outcomes from waxing when people don't read the information leaflet. Because as they wax, the epidermis or the upper layers of it get sheared off. And it's disastrous. I've seen it waxing lips and waxing legs. Uh, and it's a disaster, so remind them not to get waxing. It commonly photosensitizes people, 
Uh, that doesn't dissuade me from prescribing it in summer. And actually, I tell the patients, you should really practice the sun protection. You should be practicing anyway, but I go ahead and prescribe it during summer. It's secreted in breast milk, so it's not for lactating mothers if you're thinking about giving it to a mum that's having a, has just had a baby. Some effects are unpredictable, and actually I've seen paronychia mist as a side effect. Uh, it's probably an effect of the fragility of the skin, mm -hmm. but they get very painful um, nails, um, bur uh, and nails um, and their skin. It gets inflamed and sore, particularly big toenails. So I have seen people go ahead and have a wedge resection when in fact the correct treatment is to stop the right. isotretinoin okay. and generally it will settle with time. For some people, you can get quite surprising musculoskeletal side effects. They ache. And that's important, particularly for teenagers who may be very keen athletes. Mm. And it seems anecdotally to affect older patients as well. Headache is a problem that can get benign intracranial hypertension, so that should be stopped. They can get nausea and blurred vision. He Sorry, just, Sorry, a, Grace, just yeah. a question about the headache. And yeah. I, I know that you talk a little bit later about drug interactions yeah. that may also contribute to it. So you're telling me that with that particular medication on its own, it can cause um, headache related to an increased pressure. Absolutely. So right. if somebody has headache, just stop it and generally it'll settle very quickly. What's the mechanism, mechanism behind it? Not, you know? not known for certain, but it may relate to increased CSF production and perhaps right. reduced absorption by the arachnoid villi because the drug is somehow interacting with the cell membrane there. But honestly, don't know. Okay. Not known. Okay. So night vision, it can affect night vision. It's very important for pilots, particularly commercial pilots, mm. because they will have to declare they're on this drug and there may be a stand down time for them to be careful with that. The evidence around isotretinoin and inflammatory bowel disease is equivocal. But if you have somebody with inflammatory bowel disease, for sure, then you mm -hmm. should discuss the possibility that uh, it may uh, perhaps be flared by the drug. And it's not sufficient, uh, it's not sufficient quantities in semen but to be of concern for a man taking it for a teratogenic effect. Before we move on, just uh, we've had a question pop up with yeah. regards to the hair thinning. Yeah. So is it reversible? Yeah, generally, generally it will stop, generally. It's quite interesting um, with all hair shedding disorders, uh, particularly in women, hair is shed all the time and mm. some will complain it's never quite the same as it was before, but generally it will recover when it's stopped. Okay, great. Thank you. Let's carry on. Thank you. Now, um, tetracyclines are often used to treat acne, which is absolutely fine, mm -hmm. but they do interact with isotretinoin because tetracyclines in their own will could produce intracranial hypertension. So it's very important to have a stand down period. If you're going to stop doxy and then switch to isotretinoin, give them a break to get it out of their system. Remember, it's got quite a long half-life mm -hmm. doxy, so often I'd give them a week or two before starting it. And I have seen patients who have an intercurrent infection treated with a tetracycline, so it's important to avoid that class of drug. Sure. And if they're keen on vitamin supplements, remember that isotretinoin is derived from vitamin mm. A, so get them to avoid the vitamin A supplements because they'll get excessive dryness. Mm -hmm. And actually, if you're on isotretinoin, there is no need to use another agent. So if they're using a topical retinoid, just stop it because they'll be dry enough with the isotretinoin without the need to add uh, more with the topical treatments. Now, just a question about yes. some side effects um, yep. that stood up a few sort of points of interest. A general question about side effects, if you stop the medication yep. um, and then you restart the medication, I'm assuming that some of the predictable side effects will occur, but with yes. the unpredictable ones, is it anyone's guess? Yes, I think partly you've got to do, assess the degree of severity. Okay. So people that ha might have a paranicca, for example, you can treat them, get them over it and restart. But mm -hmm. almost without exception, start at a lower dose. Go okay. very cautiously before you introduce it. I'd be very cautious about isotretinoin headache. Mm -hmm. um, I have reintroduced it successfully, 
but sometimes at half or quarter of the dose mm. but be cautious with that side effect. I imagine that'll be quite tricky as well because headache is such a common condition. How do you determine that it's due to uh, the medication or it's just that the Absolutely. Headache? So some people have migraines and headaches mm. anyway but often they'll tell you the character or the frequency or the nature of the headache mm -hmm. has changed and that should alert you that okay. something's up. And before we move on to the yep. next page, a final question. Oh, they're coming in thick and fast. Awesome. Uh, with regards to dry eyes, is it a common side effect? Someone's just commented that they had a patient who discontinued the treatment eight years ago of yeah. isotretinoin and since then has had irreversible dry eyes. Yeah. So dryness um, is a problem and particularly need to be careful with people who wear contact lenses, for example. Mm -hmm. And again, it's a risk benefit. Uh, you can mm -hmm. sometimes treat them but with a much lower dose and they're comfortable. If they need eye drops or they've got to see an ophthalmologist, stop it. Okay, all right. And just a question about the cream. Yeah. Is there any uh, teratogenic effect with the cream of tevotinoin? Um, the data sheet says don't give it mm -hmm. to anyone that's planning a family or is pregnant. So theoretically, yes. In practice, I've had one or two women who didn't know they were pregnant and they've got away with it. But the counsel is safety. So if they're going to have a baby, don't use a topical retinoid, benzyl peroxide aqua gel you could use, for example. Okay. The absorption is minimal. Sure, sure. Um, we'll save some of these questions for a little bit later yep. on. So if you don't mind carrying on. Yeah, we'll go. Here we go. Next button. So um, this is a big one and you must not have a consultation about isotretinone without discussing depression and the next few slides address that issue. So you take the ball by the horns and bring it up as a subject. Talk to the patient and often actually mums and dads are quite concerned about it. So there's great concern in the community and worldwide this issue has led to significant uh, medical legal issues. So my own habit is that if they have an established formal psychiatric diagnosis, always liaise with their carer. So I had a patient at Middlemore had a major depressive illness and we didn't do anything until we'd liaised with the psychiatrist, that is key. But the real question is, does the drug itself cause depression and mood change? And to temper that, you have to remember that many people get very depressed because of their acne, an isotrep known used well is a very effective treatment for this disorder. So some of the literature, this is a meta-analysis which was published last year, so it's really quite high level um, data, 31 studies. And this study concluded that there was no significant change in depression scores with isotretinone compared to other treatments. And the prevalence of depression declined after isotretinone treatment, presumably because a lot of these people were very unhappy with their skin. Our MedSafe has very pragmatic advice. I've cut and pasted this from their website and I'll read it. So patients with acne are at risk of developing depression and or suicidal ideation. All patients with isotretinone should be monitored for symptoms of depression. Patients and caregivers should be informed of the risk of depression and or suicidal ideation. Again, it goes back to the original slide of counselling and informing the patient. Patients should be advised to seek medical advice immediately if these symptoms occur, even after isotretinone has been discontinued, because there are reports of depression mm. occurring after, which is quite interesting. Simply stopping isotretinone treatment may not relieve the symptoms of depression, an additional treatment may be required for some patients. So what do I say to patients without a formal um, psychiatric diagnosis? I tell them, I'm explicit with them, that there is evidence that isotretinoin is not associated with depression and treating the acne may make you feel better because the evidence supports that. But I also tell them that the issue of depression is unresolved and if you feel low when you're taking the drug, stop it immediately and let me know. And that served me well, actually, over the years of using this drug. Also surgery, interesting topic, because a lot of teenagers, for example, might be getting their wisdom teeth out. 
So what to do if they're going to have surgery? Stop it. Stop it, I think, is a good advice. And again, this is uh, a critically appraised uh, review from the BJD 2014. And again, I think this is sensible. On the basis that isotretinoin was not essential for the patient at the time, that a semi-urgent procedure needed to be done, we decided it was prudent to stop treatment prior to elective surgical procedures. That's quite good advice. So I get them to stop it at least two weeks before the surgery, get the all clear, the hunky-dory, all is good, and then to restart it. And just as a side, um, flights are quite interesting. Um, so if people are going on long flights, uh, perhaps um, to Europe, stopping it a week or two beforehand, because it's very little um, humidity in those pl oh, flights. Right. So that's quite good pragmatic advice. And with regards yes. to restarting it, when you mean yeah. all clear, are we talking about good healing, healing margins, yeah. it's all done and dusted before we actually restart? So um, we have a patient at counties having surgery, mm -hmm. and I'm going to wait to hear from the surgeon, okay. probably via the patient, that the wound is recovered, they're back to normal, and we can restart. Homeostasis has been achieved, particularly the surgical sites have healed. Okay. And what's the mechanism behind the delayed wound healing? A good question. Again, not entirely known, but um, wound healing requires adnetural structures to function well. Mm -hmm. For example, stem cells are retained in the pilosebaceous unit. An isotretinone does a pretty good job of stopping them working for a right. while. So you just need time for them to recover so that surgery can be um, um, undertaken safely. And also, as I mentioned earlier, um, shearing of the skin is a problem. So if you're going to cut through the skin, and shearing as an effect, as I've shown with waxing, you need the mm -hmm. skin to be in good nick before you cut into it. Okay, okay. And so I was just curious about, yep. uh, you, you mentioned flight risk in terms of um, the impact on the eyes and humidity. How yep. common is that? Um, I think for a short flight, it's not a problem. But if you're going, for example, to Europe on a 24 or 36 hour flight, mm -hmm. why bother? Uh, sure. You're dry enough without it, and it's safer, I think, to stop it beforehand, mm -hmm. feel relatively normal, take eye drops, and then restart it when you're there, or just take a break. Taking a break is fine, actually. You can restart, and the end point will be the same. Okay, so that's some good pragmatic advice. Motor on? Yes, please. Um, one question is children and age groups. So infantile and neonatal acne is often due to um, maternal transfer of hormones. But if you have a child with bad acne, the real question is why have they got the acne? It's rare, but if you had a five or six or seven year old with significant acne, ask why. And again, this was taken from a, a paper. Just think of um, hormone secreting tumors, for example. Um, menarche is getting earlier, and I have treated mm. um, sort of pre or peripubertal children who are otherwise well with isotretinone. But prolonged use, there is a risk of uh, premature epiphyseal closure. So I think if you're worried about why they have the acne, it, it would be good to think through what uh, perhaps referral is needed or are the hormones normal. So some people get horrendous scarring with their acne, and it's a shame now because you can predict who's likely to scar, uh, and you should be able to manage those people early before the scarring is um, established. So isotretinone, as we've touched on, may affect wound healing. It actually takes a pilosebaceous unit approximately 12 months to fully recover, because the drug works by in a number of ways, but it stops sebum production. And it's interesting that if people relapse after a course of isotretinone, commonly it's about 12 months when they'll come back for you mm -hmm. to see you. So some people who want cosmetic treatment for their scarring on their face need some advice around that because abnormal healing is possible if they have that too early. The deferment period is uncertain it used to be a year, but the literature would support probably at least six months before they have um, scarring treatment. And that might be Fraxel laser, for example, or resurfacing. Having said that, actually, nature's very good at doing it themselves. 
and valleys will fill and hills will flatten. And what often is eye-catching for people is the redness. And people with very severe acne, even when you treat them, the erythema around the acne papules and pustules can persist for a long time after they stop it, actually. So commonly I tell people to wait at least a year and see what nature can do for them before they consider uh, cosmetic treatments. Just, this isn't directly related to this, but really yep. tracks a little bit retrospectively with regards to surgery. GPs do a lot of minor surgery. Yep. So for individuals that need, for example, um, a lesion removed, yep. can they do that while they're on isotretinoin? Oh, would you recommend it? I would stop it. Okay. Always stop it. It's you, Why take a risk when you can stop it, not affect the outcome generally sure. of the skin disorder, and you know that you can operate safely? So I'd suggest, again, at least two weeks prior to surgery, mm -hmm. do the surgery, get them better, it's all healed, hunky-dory, then restart. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Thanks for clarifying that. And dosing is very interesting. Um, in the old days, um, we had a formula, perhaps a milligram per kilogram a day for four months, and that was very mechanistic, actually. So if you had somebody of 100 kilos, and you give them 100 milligrams of isotretinoin, most people will not cope with that dose. It's just mm. too troublesome for them. So we've gone away from dosing by recipe. And actually what I found very useful is let the patient control the dose. Mm -hmm. So although um, 20, 30 or 40 milligrams will be tolerated by most people, and in some people it's not. Mm -hmm. So if they don't like the dose they're on, just tell them to take less of it. And giving them that control I think is very useful in reaching the end point for treating their disease. And actually using lower doses for longer periods is just as good as a high dose for a short period. And lower doses for longer periods are a much, <coughs> excuse me, a much better way. Excuse me, just grab a drink. <coughs> excuse me. It's a much better way to treat the patient which is why um, slow and low is better than short and high, basically. And we'll talk about this in the next slide, but it's key that you examine the patient well. And patients who have a lot of macrocomedonal disease are people that are going to take longer because the macrocomedones are the source of the acne. Mm -hmm. So a good way to go is get all the macrocomedones gone. They have no inflammatory lesions for six to eight weeks. And I was asked to put, you know, a guesstimate of how much people might need. So I'm very hesitant about that because biological systems vary, but perhaps 30 or 40 milligrams for perhaps six to 12 months might be a rough um, rule of thumb. Mm -hmm. So these are macrocomedones, and they are, I describe them as patients, these are the seeds from which the acne come. And macrocomedones can be open, and blackheads is the lay term, or closed whiteheads, closed comedones. And interestingly, the blackness is not dirt, it's probably oxidized melanin. And it's quite important that you examine the patient carefully, because if you don't look, you don't see them. And you have to look under a good light, stretch the skin, and if you stretch the skin, you can see these little papules pouting out. And if they're present at the end of the treatment, almost inevitably the acne will come back. So you've got to keep going until those macrocomedones are gone. Um, so people see the red spots, but they don't necessarily notice the comedones and you might not notice them unless you look for them. So if they're there, keep going. So we've been asked to touch on other uses of the drug. And, you know, if you're a dermatologist, if you have a drug, you give it a go at almost anything. But actually, um, Bruce asked me some time ago about a patient who had rosacea, and I think that's what prompted this talk. And isotretinoin is quite a good second line treatment for rosacea, and we'll talk a bit more about that in a moment. Hydradenitis is related to acne, as is um, dissecting cellulitis of the scalp. And in South Auckland, we see a lot of Maori and Pacific people with that disorder. And it's an okay treatment for both of those. Nothing honestly works well for them. Some people just have greasy skin, seborrhea, so it's quite good at stopping that. 
in our derm clinic, we see a lot of people who are immunosuppressed because they've had organ transplants. And it's not a bad treatment to prevent skin cancer. You have to be very careful in these patients because they're often older and they don't mm. tolerate the drug. But if you don't know, just to give you a heads up, and I put this on the slide, there's a really interesting study in the New England Journal of Medicine, came out of Australia using nicotinamide, nicotinamide, 500 milligrams twice a day. It's pretty innocuous stuff. And I explain it to patients that it boosts recovery after UV damage. And you do see people out there who are actinopaths, who are just really crusty people covered in AK. And actually I've moved away from retinoids and would use nicotinamide because it's much better tolerated. Where you can use it, if you look at the right hand side, is people that grow lots of squames actually. Some people just pop them up all the time and low dose oral retinoids can be quite useful to reduce the rate of growth of them. But again, I'm moving over towards uh, nicotinamide now. It's perhaps a third line treatment for psoriasis, particular pustular psoriasis. So people get pustules on their hands and feet. So if you have a woman who's fertile and you don't want to give acetretin to, because remember acetretinone is a cousin of isotretinone, mm -hmm. its metabolism is slightly different. And the stand down period is two, and some references say three years after a dose of acetretinone for a woman. And that's a long time and people will forget that. So if they conceive a child and they forget they're on acetretin, it's very likely that child will have a significant um, structural damage, unfortunately. So if you've got to use it in a woman and you're running out of options, it's an option for you. And I put in the top right hand there uh, many other disorders. So SEC, congenital keratin disorders, keratoderma, granuloma annulare, and they made the list smaller and smaller because, you know, derms will give it a go with most things. But uh, that reference on the right hand side is quite useful. So these uh, uses for this particular medication, yeah. um, correct me if I'm wrong, I, my understanding is that isotretinone is licensed for acne. Yes. So if we're utilising it for some of these other conditions, are we using it on a Section 29 basis? No, I don't. I think as a doctor you can prescribe what is you think the most useful for the patient. Okay. Um, <clears throat> I'll tell them actually it's an out of licence indication that it's not something that the um, data sheet would support. Mm -hmm. But actually we're using it with evidence in the literature, particularly for rosacea, particularly for hydradenitis. And this uh, paper down on the right is quite a good summary of the evidence. So it's with evidence, so I think we're justified in using it. Great, okay. So isotretinoin and rosacea, and I've, you will see, have taken quite a number of papers from Marius down in the WICAT, who's done a lot of research around this. Generally, um, it's second line. So you'd do the first line treatment, which may be topical treatment, topical metronidazole, topical brimodine cream. You might add in an oral um, tetracycline like doxy, and it's failed. So isotretinoin is quite useful. Commonly, it's in people who are not teenagers, so it will be um, adults. So you have to be careful of the dosing. The evidence suggests you can use very low doses of isotretinoin. Um, I've actually used 20 milligrams once or twice a week, and that's achieved excellent control. So go even lower with rosacea. So are we aiming <clears throat> for control rather than remission? What I, what I would do, um, I'm a purist at heart, so I'd give them a treatment course, the lowest dose that you can get away with and stop and see what happens. So with rosacea, it is unpredictable. You can get very prolonged remission with first mm -hmm. line treatment. By definition, if you're into second line treatment, it's a more difficult disorder to control. But yes, you're aiming for remission and actually sometimes longer term treatment achieves control because they will slip back and they need a little bit in the longer term to keep it at bay. Okay, all right. Carry on. Just one more Another question. question. Uh, you've talked about biological endpoints for yep. acne. In terms of rosacea, how, in your experience, how long do we, how long have you often treated for? To be honest, um, it's often slightly less time mm -hmm. than um, with acne vulgaris, but yet looking for uh, loss of flushing, 
loss of papules, loss of pustules. There's a telangiectatic component, which you're not going to treat with isotretinoin, so that will remain unchanged. So I might give 20 milligrams a day for perhaps six to 12 months to start with, see how people get on, then stop. And you'll know because they are asymptomatic and then you can stop the drug and see. Again, I'm being a bit fuzzy because biology uh, sure. by definition mm -hmm. doesn't have certainty. Go on. Please do, yep. thank you. So I've got some scenarios now to go through how we might actually use the drug. I just want to check my notes to make sure I don't miss anything out. <clears throat> so this is a patient for this scenario who's 17 year old, who has, by my reckoning, terrible acne. That is bad acne by anybody's um, judgment. They may not perceive it, but we know that it is. And they've never been treated before for acne. So how would you treat this patient? In fact, can I ask a question? How would people treat it? Or perhaps we've lost the opportunity for a poll there. Uh, I think we'll be challenged. OK, we'll carry on. We'll have to say that for another time. So really, if you're going to make a difference with this treatment, with this person, there is no option other than to use isotretinoin. You can't use topical treatments on the back, full stop. Topical treatments are for the face. So if the back is involved, to a significant degree, you're going to have to use a systemic treatment. And this acne is terrible. So with this person, you would go long and low. They're going to need easily a year's treatment, if not longer. So in this patient, only isotretinoin will help. And you have to ask and make sure that they're sexually or are not sexually active. And that can be an awkward conversation if you have that with a mum um, or some close relative. So I get around that by depersonalizing it. And I'd say to mum and the patient, if they're there, a woman who is sexually active must not get pregnant on this drug. A woman must have effective birth control. So you don't need to pry into their personal life, but you can make it very, very explicit for them about how you're going to treat them. So I just want to check my notes here. Yes. So with this patient, <clears throat> and with all patients, firstly, in your notes, write down that you've given them an information sheet. The companies will make them, Dermnet will do it. Always write in the notes that you've discussed the putative association with depression. Write it so it's there. Write that you've discussed teratogenicity and always get um, um, informed consent. I get it written in the notes. I think that's good practice because people forget what you tell them and it's good to show um, an external scrutiny, an external scrutineer that you've been careful in the practice. Do you have any um, specific consent forms or resources that you access that are available in the community? Um, actually, at counties, somehow they seem to arrive. I think the drug manufacturers make them, actually, so you can ask for them. I think Douglas will provide them. Or you can um, just make one yourself, clone it. Um, there are templates that you can use, but always get written consent. My understanding also is that um, there's a primary health care organisation, um, uh, I should say educational centre yeah. called BPAC, that has consent forms and information that GPs and other primary health care practitioners that do prescribe this, they can utilise that. Yeah. And they, it's quite easy to find uh, yeah. on the internet. Just had a question coming in with regards to that. Yeah. Thank you. So in this woman, a young girl, before starting it, I'd always do baseline buds and always do a beta HCG on every woman that could possibly um, have a baby. <clears throat> With this woman, you need to be very careful introducing isotretinoin. So one of the problems of the drug is that it can flare acne, uh, usually about 10 days or 14 days after starting. So if you put this person on full dose straight away, the flare can be awful. So they can get, um, pyogenic granuloma type reactions where they're covered in um, or, or an awful rash. So you need to go very carefully. And if it's this severe, sometimes I'll bracket the introduction of isotretinoin with a second agent, such as erythromycin, or occasionally even a short course of prednisone to minimize the flare that you can almost certainly predict with this person. 
and I'd start very low. So if she was 70 kilos, start with 10 milligrams. In fact, um, five milligrams has been funded by Pharmax. So go really low, really slow. And then I always check people about four weeks in to see how it's going. So are you tolerating the drug? Are they very exquisitely sensitive to the dryness or not? Should you reduce the dose? How's the mood? And I'd repeat the bloods at four weeks to make sure they're stable. And perhaps a little bit softer, orthodoxy is every three months, but there are some patients who may be high risk. For example, if they have fatty liver, um, we're looking after people with um, liver transplants, for example. So you wanna make sure um, those LFTs are normal. So there may be good reason to check the bloods more frequently. And generally, if they're up and running, see them approximately three monthly. And for this person, you wouldn't stick with 10. You might be able to edge the dose up to 20, 30, perhaps 40, depending on how they feel about it. Just with regards to the erythromycin <clears throat> and prednisone, what sort of doses are you looking at for either of those? Um, so I'd start um, prednisone or erythromycin often two weeks before starting mm -hmm. isotretinoin. So erythromycin might be 400 milligrams BD, start it and then run it on for another couple of weeks from starting the drug. And prednisone, depending on the build, you might go perhaps 40, 30, 20, 10, 5 over about four to six weeks. As you know, steroids can cause acne, mm. but actually in this person, the risk of a profound flare is almost predictable, so you just do it. Okay, great. So how about this um, person? I'm sorry, there's one other point I wanted to make. With your, okay, if you want to. I think with the isotretinoin, take it with a meal because it's absorbed. It's absorbed better with a fatty meal, so I often get them to take it with the biggest meal of the day. Sorry, I'm going to pause you there. There was a bit of an ulterior motive because there are <laughs> more questions coming yep. up. Um, someone's quite keen to know if um, there's any impact of the medication on renal function. Not to my knowledge, no. Great, thank you for clarifying that. And with regards to monitoring. We get taught it is usually about three monthly. Yeah. Is that still the general recommendations? Yeah. Is there flexibility in that? There's flexibility in everything. Um, I actually did a huge uh, audit of my own results. Mm -hmm. And you can argue if you've got a fit and healthy person, a couple of post-treatment bloods are okay, why bother? But orthodoxy is three monthly. And honestly, mm -hmm. generally, that's what I would do. That's what I would do. Okay. And with regards to, uh, to the blood test again, someone's just asked the question if they notice, if you noticed a lipid rise yeah. within the 17 year old, uh, what would you do? So lipid abnormalities are very common, very common. So they'll often go up a little mm -hmm. bit and that does not dissuade me from carrying on. What you do have to watch out for is the triglycerides. And I've had one or two people whose triglycerides go through the roof mm -hmm. and they are at risk of pancreatitis. So if you get that, stop. Okay. And I'm oh, sorry, these questions, they really do keep coming awesome, in. Awesome, that's good. <laughs> With regards to um, the severity of this acne, yeah. if you could just give us um, some understanding with regards to why this person is at risk of a flare when using the medication. I don't, I don't know that the pathophysiology is known. Mm -hmm. Although one theory is that the drug dries the skin up and then the acne, propionibacterium acnes, which is a bug that surrounds the osteum, die. And perhaps it's an immunological reaction to that. We know that people with bad acne like this are very likely to flare, and perhaps that's the mechanism. And because we know that, it's important that you tread carefully. It's, um, I guess, clinical evidence, and there's some theoretical evidence as to why it will happen. Okay. And with regards to flaring, are there any other conditions or circumstances where people would be at risk of flaring? Yes. Um, if you have a lot of macrocomedones as well, I'd go slowly. Um, the people can flare, they've got predominantly macrocomedonal disease. So really a good principle here is to always start low. Start okay. low. Great. Um, uh, sorry, I'll let you carry, carry on. on. <laughs> okay, roger that. So here's a um, different scenario. So this is a 33-year-old woman with troublesome facial acne only. It's never really settled. And how are we going to treat this person? And it's quite interesting that, uh, to a degree, the demographics of acne are changing. And we recognize that women may have 
mild acne that just never gets better. And for them, it's a very significant problem. So while here I am with my acne ladder again, you might grade it as, as ho-hum. For a woman, particularly of that age, they do not want their teenage acne, full stop. Thank you very much. And often um, they'll come in covered in makeup because they're very keen to hide it. Again, you have to have your sensitivity antennae switched on. So actually these people do really well with isotretinoin and that's one use of it actually. And then they may come back and um, with that woman, I'd give them a full treatment course, again, slow and low rather than high and short. And as I've told you earlier, 12 months is a common relapse time for actually anybody that's had um, isotretinoin. So if they come back after 12 months, what now? What now? So again, um, using low dose intermittent courses of isotretinoin can be very helpful for these people, provided they're willing to take it. There is a vogue actually uh, that you could use a topical retinoid for these people once you've treated them to prevent prophylaxis, and that's a way of avoiding isotretinoin for those that don't want to take it. But low dose intermittent courses of isotretinoin can be very effective. Again, it can be even 10 milligrams twice a week. It, it works surprisingly well. Uh, with this lady and her age group, um, yep. she may be thinking about pregnancy. Yeah. And someone's just written and asking a question with regards to how long should we wait in terms of stopping the medication and she allowed to try the pregnancy. So the standard advice is they need to wait at least a, at least a month. The biology is that it goes out of the system pretty quickly, but I guess it's quite good that they have a, a menstrual cycle. You know they're not pregnant mm. and then they, they're good to go. Thank you. So this is um, scenario three a 14 year old boy with troublesome acne and it's never really settled and what would you do with this boy so this person has never had treatment ever and uh, although they may be quite upset by it at 14 you really are beholden i think unless there's good reason to do the standard stuff first so um, use uh, an oral antibiotic and remember the antibiotic is working probably as an anti-inflammatory agent and not for killing bugs and a topical retinoid. And I'll just check my next slide, yes. So we're in the days of antibiotic stewardship. Mm. So never prescribe an antibiotic either topically or systemically as a sole agent, because there's interesting data that you induce resistance in the community and that can be handed on to other bugs. So always use two agents that work in a different way. So I quite like an oral antibiotic and a topical retinoid, for example. Um, treat them for 12 weeks and then review them. And if honestly they're not much better, then you might then want to go to isotretinoin because it's a very effective treatment. So on my acne ladder here, I'll put that acne as moderate. It's not too bad, but they've not trialed anything else. So I wouldn't necessarily leap into isotretinoin. Good to go? Good to go. Uh, and if it comes back, as I've said, you'd give them isotretinoin probably after three months. And again, all that counselling that we've talked about needs to be strictly adhered to. So here's an interesting scenario. When I was training, I was very lucky to train with a world expert in acne. And he took me to this patient and he said, what do you think of this person's acne? And this person had no acne at all, which is a bit odd. So I looked at him and he looked at me and this was my introduction to dysmorphophobic acne, which is a body image disorder. So it is very important to recognize these people who perhaps to you, your eye and my eye, there's no acne at all, but for them, it's a really big problem. And it's really outside that 95% um, bell curve. They're at the extreme end. So you have to watch out for these people um, there's obviously a grey zone into which you do it, but dysmorphophobic, dysmorphophobic acne is unusual. You need to recognise them and probably I'd consider referral because um, suicides have been reported and Bill Cunliffe um, wrote this disorder up and occasionally you do see people who are distraught 
by almost nothing to see. Um, so be mindful of those people. The key thing is not to write them off. Again, it goes down to Dermatology 101. Find out how much their acne troubles them. And it does just lead me on to the isotretinoin addict. So there are some people who start it and you can never get them off it. Uh, and they can be a difficult group to manage. Next one. So I think if I just check my notes, yes, this is our final scenario. And um, so this is, a, again, a 45-year-old woman who has papulopustular rosacea. And a bit like that young lad, you do the sensible things first. You treat them topically, topical metronidazole. Brimidine is available in New Zealand. It's not funded. It's an alpha agonist. You might then add in a um, oral antibiotic and then it doesn't work, so what do you do? So again, very low dose isotretinoin, even lower than acne can work very well for these people as we've hinted at. Uh, yeah, I think that's the slide. So go low and slow with these people and go the, with those uh, um, dosing regimes that I um, talked about earlier. So just to wrap up, and I'm happy to take questions because we've still got some time. The key thing is deciding where it should go on that acne severity ladder. So there's not a wrong or a right answer, actually. You need to be go along the journey with your patient, find out what they've had before, what their perception is, and where to place it. And returning to the first slide, so you're going to do it with the patient. It is very much a partnership with this drug. Honestly, you've got to find out what they know, because they might have gone on the internet to discover it's the worst drug out, but actually you and I know it can be very helpful. Some of them have had it before and they know exactly what they're letting themselves in for. And interestingly, I've had people who are in their 40s and 50s who bring their children along. And there is a hereditary component to acne. Mm -hmm. So they, the first thing mum or dad will say is, whatever happens, don't give them that awful drug that I had 20 years ago because it was horrendous experience for me. And that was because we're dosing by recipe. So we gave them 80 milligrams because they're 80 kilos. So you can address that straight out and say, look, nowadays we're not going to do that. It's low and slow and we'll find a dose that works. I cannot emphasize enough to you how important it is to spend time talking to the patient about the drug. Always get informed consent, always pregnancy test, always discuss mood change. It's very important. Um, give them a written information sheet and document that in the notes so that there is um, external scrutiny that you practice safely. Long and low, better than short and high. And there we are, we've done it. Okay, all right. Uh, we have some questions. Yep, uh, far away. Now, um, we'll, I think we'll just wrap up some questions with regards to the medication itself. Yep. Because in your scenarios, you've drawn on utilizing other forms of treatment that sparked a few questions on its own. Yeah. So just to, oh, first, just a comment. Thank you to the listener who wrote and reminding me that with regards to consent forms, please check on your local health pathways. Um, there's, there's usually a consent form that's attached to that. Now, some people have asked questions with regards to using the medication at younger ages yep. and at older ages, and you've mentioned needing to look at uh, reasons why um, an individual, if they're young, maybe having significant acne. Correct. Now, just sort of uh, tipping on uh, the age, just clarifying in terms of the age group that we can utilise this at. You've used a scenario of 14 years of age. Yeah. Can we inch a bit lower? Oh, yes. yes. Yeah, okay. absolutely. I mean, I've treated, um, as I mentioned earlier, young girls who are just about entering puberty and have okay. horrendous acne. So, again, be careful with tetracyclines. I think the mm. age group was, I think it's 12, isn't it? You have to be careful of the teeth that you That's don't right. stain them. Mm. So you'd not use one of those. But you do the sensible things. Doesn't work, then do isotretinone. Again, be careful, and mums are very sensitive about their daughters and young children yeah. having it. And that leads us um, just to dovetail that on the other end, yeah. using it in people that are 50 or older. Yeah. Are there any particular precautions that we need to be aware about? I've treated people in their 50s and 60s with acne, mm -hmm. with isotretinoin, and even more so, go low. Um, this, the elderly, and this is anecdotal, elderly, I guess elderly is relative, isn't it, if mm -hmm. you're in your 50s, 
um, they will more like to get musculoskeletal side effects. They're achy joints. They don't like that side effect. And my observation is they're more likely to get it. So go low, go low with them. Okay. And with regards to using the medication in terms of time frame, yeah. can we use it for years? Someone's posed a question of five years. <clears throat> mm. It's a bit open-ended, isn't mm. it? Um, I guess you can use it. I have used it long term in very few people. My advice to you, though, is first of all, give them a treatment course and stop okay. and see where you get to. If they relapse once, well, that's fine. Statistically, for acne vulgaris, roughly 20% will receive another course of the drug within five years. That's OK. But if it's very long, you've got to wonder why, what are we treating here? Mm. Um, are they a dysmorphophobic acne? It begins to raise other issues if you find you're using it for a long, long time. So you might ask that question to yourself. You might seek advice. Uh, with regards to investigation, someone's written in asking a question about deranged LFTs. Yeah. Depending on how high, when, <laughs> <laughs> yes, very good. Uh, yep. when would you continue and when would you monitor and when would you stop? Well, one of the values of doing a baseline LFTs is you know where you start. And sadly, in South Auckland, the BMI is enormous. Mm. So many people have fatty liver, even children, actually. So if it's really bad, then often I ask gastroenterology, we're lucky we can just ask them, what do you think? If it's a bit above normal, I would go for it actually. And if you're concerned, I'll do weekly tests to make sure that all is well before you're happy, you know, that the thing is stable. Um, okay. Think of hep B, hep C, you know, think of why the LFTs might be deranged because it is potentially a hepatotoxic drug. So if it's well off the boil when you start, before you start the drug, mm. investigate that, find out why before you give them something that may make their LFTs worse. So again, it's a matter of using your clinical judgment in this setting with this patient. Okay, all right. Gosh, where do I pick through now? Now, I think at this particular point in time, there's just one more question that someone's asked with regards to the medication. Yeah. And it is, is there any place for isotretin no and psoriasis exacerbated by lithium? <laughs> um, well, lithium causes severe and it can cause acne. And again, if you're treating somebody who's taking lithium, they've got a major mm, disorder there. Right. So the first thing to do is liaise with the person that prescribed it. Um, and that you might consider referral. Um, there is a risk if they became depressed on lithium because their manic depression was out of control and you've given them isotretinoin, you're uh, possibly digging a hole. So my advice there is tread carefully, do the first thing and liaise with their psychiatrist or the person that prescribed it before you embark on it. That's a waffly question. Short answer probably is, but tread very carefully. Okay. It, perhaps you might consider referral. Okay, all right. Now, someone is wondering, just for clarity really, yeah. um, in utilising, we talked about antimicrobial um, uh, care really and stewardship, yeah. that was the yeah. word that was used. Someone was wanting to know how does two agents help with that? Yeah, because you're less likely to get resistance. So um, as a practice point, I never use uh, topical fusidic acid, for example, because it's been well demonstrated that if you use topical antibiotics, you can quickly develop resistance. So basically what you're doing with two agents is attacking it from different angles, mm -hmm. uh, and that minimizes the risk of a resistant organism forming, and therefore minimizes the risk to community that it may be handed around. Okay. Now, we'll just sort of move back to some of the other medications that yep. people use for acne. What are your thoughts on utilizing contraception? Yeah, I think that can work quite well in the right setting. That's a good idea. Okay. There has been some, is there a difference between using things like Jeanette versus just your standard contraception or would a standard contraception like Levelin do for that kind of treatment? Yes, again, um, it depends. Again, you're going to assess the patient and give it a go. I think there is evidence that standard contraceptives may be helpful. Mm -hmm. Obviously, Jeanette with the Cyprotrain acetate has an, an additional effect, 
um, a patient's got and I rely on you actually my colleagues here to prescribe it because I don't mm -hmm, so mm -hmm. I agree it can be useful okay. what, remember what the patient wants actually is no acne so give it a go if it's safe to use it go for it but if you're not getting to the end point move on to something else um, a few questions about topical agents yeah. uh, topical gosh I'm not quite sure what it is uh, if a clear duo have you heard of that one I think that's a combo, isn't it? I mm. think that's a combo. That would be my guess yeah. from the... They just, no, no, sorry. <laughs> they're just wondering about the effectiveness of it in low-grade yeah. acne. So topical treatments, the key to using them is that often patients don't use them properly. Mm. So they get a red spot and they'll rub it on the red spot. They'll get another one, rub it on the red spot. And basically it's like painting a bridge. They'll go to one end and start again. So they need to use it on all of their face. You want to create a field to change. So I'm explicit when I use a topical treatment. Apply it to the face, the forehead, the nose, the cheeks, to the jawline, because you're trying to run ahead of the acne. Use it every day. Don't expect a miracle. Go for three months. If you use a topical retinoid or um, benzyl peroxide aqua gel, there will be some drying. Mm. So good ways to put it on at night wash it off during the uh, in the morning put a moisturizer on but get them to use it properly okay okay now someone's just asked the question is um, spironolactone don't use for acne at all uh, I wouldn't go there no okay okay it's pretty short sharp out <laughs> great <laughs> Very clear. no uh, I think if you're into that then honestly there are much better things to use what about laser treatment yes um, there is, uh, in terms of light therapies for um, acne, there's not a great evidence base. There's a far greater evidence base for the orthodox treatment. If we're talking about laser treatment for scarring, again, there's evidence base, and we've, talk we've, talk we've talked about that. But the evidence, in my view, is not persuasive about light treatment. There are plenty of studies out there using PDT lasers mm -hmm. and using natural porphyrins. So there probably is a benefit for some, but there are better medical therapists. But some people don't want the medicine. You know, mm -hmm. they'd rather use the light treatment. So there is some, some evidence to support its use. And uh, with regards to topical retinoids yep. being contraindicated with a family history of non-melanoma skin cancer, can you comment on that? Uh, is it? I don't believe that it is. Um, generally, you're going to be using uh, topical retinoids in young people. Mm. And retinoids, as we've discussed, can be chemoprotective for people with sun damage. Um, and topical retinoids are good actually for reversing fine wrinkling uh, retrieve cream for example mm -hmm. in, in its cosmetic use so um, you can use it on actinically damaged skin which reminds me of a question that was asked a little bit earlier on in yep. the piece um, with regards to isotretinoin being used as treatment for wrinkles is that actually uh, read that journal i don't think the evidence okay. is there topical Retinoids, absolutely, there's quite good evidence. Um, it will reverse uh, fine wrinkling. Yes. I've read it and I believe it. So the evidence is there. Systemic treatment, honestly, I think is overkill. Fair enough. In my view. Great. Okay. All right. Gosh, I think we've gone through quite a few questions tonight. Awesome. Yes. Um, and I think we'll wrap it up here. So thank you very much for coming along and talking to us about this topic. It's been really informative, it's been in-depth, and I've learned, a, I've learned a lot. So thank you very much, Paul. Well, it's very kind of you, and I hope to all of New Zealand out there that was helpful for you in your practice. It's a pleasure to be asked. Thank you. Welcome. So just to remind everyone that um, our next webinar is on the 2nd of July. It'll be a men's health topic, what you do when Viagra doesn't work. Um, you'll find it, further details on our website and you'll also find a copy of this talk um, on our website in due course. So thank you very much, everybody, and good night. Thank you.